Hi, um, thank you to everyone for joining us um, for this important conversation. Um, LBTQ Women in the Workplace Perspectives from APAC. My name is Karina Hendren and I am the Senior Associate for Global Stakeholder Engagement at Out and Equal. And my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to go through some logistics. Today's virtual offering will last for about an hour. In the last 15 minutes or so will be reserved for a question and answer session with our esteemed panelists, whom I will introduce shortly. So please feel free to send along your questions, comments, and experiences using the chat or the Q&A function. We want this to be as interactive as possible. And if you want to reach out to us throughout and after the call, you can also do so by emailing us at hello at outandequal.org. So moving right along, in a recent global, and I'll emphasize that this is a global study by McKinsey, 58% um, of LGBTQ women in the workplace were out as compared to 80% of LGBTQ men. It is also important to note that folks outside of Europe and North America are also less likely to be out in the workplace. And then another statistic which I think ties this together is that in this same global survey, LBTQ women who are out at work were half as likely to say that they plan to leave their employer in the next year, thus demonstrating the importance of a welcoming workplace environment. And in order for anyone to feel comfortable coming out in the workplace, there is a lot of groundwork that needs to be done. And it hopefully goes without saying that the APAC region is diverse and this panel makes up only a small part of that. And we're not here to compare and contrast countries, but to come together and to learn from each other. And it's our hope that our discussion today will provide you all with some valuable insight and best practices on creating welcoming workplaces, particularly for, particularly for LBTQ women throughout the APAC region. And um, now I will turn it over to um, today's panelists to introduce themselves. Um, so um, whoever would like to go first, feel free to, feel free to hop in. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shweta. I'm joining uh, from a city called Bangalore in India with my two cats at home. Um, uh, been, 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 in the, uh, been working in the HR people space for the past 14 years, uh, very actively having led on the inclusion and diversity agenda. Um, currently working with a company um, called Hacker Earth, uh, leading the people function uh, over there. Um, so, so if I have to really, I don't really like label, but if I have to really pick a letter uh, out of the entire spectrum, right? I would, I would say B, bisexual, but I don't uh, date men anymore. Attraction, yes, no emotional connection. So don't date men anymore. I think it's better this way, both of us, I said. So um, um, hi to everyone again. I'm really excited to uh, be a part of this conversation. Looking forward. Hello, namaste. Hello, namaste. Uh, my name is Shane Mills. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, I'm an active a transgender activist for my country. Um, uh, I'm based in India, city Hyderabad. I've been working with Dell Technologies uh, for 10 years. And, uh, and I say a very important role uh, in this corporate world is to sensitize companies about how it is how important it is for us to give you know open space to transgender community and i'm here to share my experience and i'm looking forward for your questions and i hope you have a great morning or evening whichever part of the country you guys have logged in from okay i can go next uh, my name is Geraldine. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she and her. I'm based in Singapore, uh, about three and a half years in Oracle. Uh, it's been an amazing journey here. Um, my second head is also the um, community lead, lead for Singapore. So in Oracle, we call it Open, Oracle Pride and Employee Network. So over the last three and a half years, I've seen how Oracle has really um, strive to be more inclusive. We already are, we have a lot of policies in place, but um, it's an ongoing journey. And I'm so grateful to be part of this um, exciting company that really values um, you know, individuals, uh, whatever the background, uh, preferred uh, you know, sexual orientation or gender identities so far and so forth. 
So I'm looking forward to interacting with all of you today. Okay, so I think I'm the next one. So hi everyone, uh, this is Alexis. Good morning, um, good afternoon, good evening, um, wherever you are. And first of all, hello from Shanghai, China. Yeah, it's what an honor to be here. I'm a little nervous, so excuse that. Uh, and I'm here today as I think many different roles that I play in the society. Well, firstly, um, I think we're talking about corporate world. So I'm here as a learning development manager and a trainer at Nielsen, uh, who's known for its market research and data science um, uh, expertise. And I'm also the chair of Nielsen's Inclusion Impact Team here, which uh, who is a leadership team uh, that drives uh, programs for seven ERGs here and oversees the DNI policies in China, including for Pride ERG. And third, I'm here as a representative from Shanghai Pride's uh, leadership uh, team, and I'm focused on workplace equality, and we've organized job fairs and workplace forums for the audience here. Fourth, um, very importantly, I am uh, a proud, open, openly queer woman, and I, my preferred pronoun is she and her. I was out to myself at maybe 12, out to my parents at 26, uh, out to work at 26 as well, later that year. Yeah, and um, I'm originally from Taipei, Taiwan, yay Taiwan, uh, but I spent actually many of my formative years in Shanghai and Hong Kong. So like three cities across APAC. Uh, anyways, I really look forward to today's discussion and I welcome all questions. Don't be afraid to ask. I'll tell you all that I know. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Great. Uh, well, thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm very excited to get started, but before we do, uh, we'd love to hear from the audience and find out where you all are calling in from today. So feel free to hop in the chat function and let us know where you're calling in from. So I'm uh, based in Washington, DC um, in the United States. Um, and it'll be great to hear um, where we have folks in. So I see if you, we've got folks from Ireland, just the suburbs of Chicago, Shanghai, Connecticut, Florida, Missouri, ooh, Australia, awesome. Minnesota, DC, Gaithersburg, Hong Kong. Wow, these are flying in. Oh, nice, Rehoboth Beach. Um, uh, UK, India, Sao Paulo, Czech Republic, another Sao Paulo, Queens, India, Costa Rica. So we've got folks from all over the world on this. So this is very, very exciting. Um, Great, Singapore as well, awesome. Ooh, I'm also from Columbia, Maryland. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, thank you all so much for joining us. And so continue to feel free to continue to type in your, uh, where you're calling in from, but it's great for us to, to know where everyone's, um, where everyone is currently. Um, so thanks again. Um, so to get us started, and I will let anyone hop in who would like to, what are some of the unique challenges faced by LBTQ women in the workplace and why do these challenges exist? Big question, but it's, it's just to kind of get us started off. Uh, I like to answer this question, you know, um, why does this exist? You know, the very point, you know, especially I'm going, I'm going to talk from in, uh, the, the India perspective, um, you know, at the very point that you're born, you know, the question, the gender tag happens there. The real discrimination happens at the point of birth. You know, someone wants a male baby, someone wants a female baby, and you know, that confusion starts there because a country like India, where you know, where men are treated with more priority than women, you know, and coming back to the LGBT community, it's even more worse. So it is important, uh, you know, uh, that, that we do not discriminate, and it is important that we draw equality for all genders and we do not hashtag as male, female or any gender. So um, that's why it's important. And especially at workplace, you know, uh, it is important because at workplace, you know, you tend to assume things that a woman can do this, a man can do this. No, she's a transgender. Will she be able to handle this? Or no, she's a lesbian. I don't think she'll be able to face this, you know? So those kind of, assumptions need to be broken. And that's what we are here to let people know that do not assume about the community, know about them and they have the potential, give them the chance. 
Um, Shane, um, Shane, that was great. I'm going to just add on to what you're saying, okay? And I know you kind of delve deep into the root cause of it. And Karina, again, to that question, what comes into my mind is, um, one is there is there is a um, I think I would say um, the the whole feeling of not feeling safe to come out um, at a workplace, right? And and uh, that's probably one of the uh, main challenges that women from the LGBTQ community face. And I'm, I'm talking from an experience from a DNI um, expert out here, and also being a woman myself, and then from the community, right? Now, uh, and I'll try and keep it short and give a short answer to this. So I think. Um, there are strong gender stereotypes associated, uh, especially with being a woman in itself, right? If you're a woman, then you're supposed to be like this and you're not supposed to be like this or like that. And then there is another set of strong stereotypes associated with, hey, if you're, if you're someone from the LDQT uh, community, then there is another set of stereotypes associated with, oh, if you're a lesbian, then you're supposed to look like this, or you're supposed to dress like this or not like that. So I'm just saying, so I think there is a deep-rooted uh, um, uh, cause coming uh, from there. And then obviously at a workplace, when you think about and you look at, right, one is you're not feeling safe to come out. Um, and then secondly, who are, who are you visibly seeking out? There are not too many. Uh, and again, I haven't worked in many other different countries. I have worked with MNC, US, British, right? Uh, and I know that, so they're, they're very, hardly any role models out there. And I'm gonna use the word role models from that perspective, right? Not too many people who are out there from the community, right? So, so then you, you don't visibly see people. Um, and then obviously you're thinking about, hey, um, if, 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 if I have to really be myself, the whole of myself, get, to, get the whole of myself to work, how are people around me going to react to it? You don't have, uh, uh, you don't have a previous experience so much to fall back on that, right? Unless, and I'm, and I'm sure we'll come to it at some point in time, unless there are, there, there are company policies, there are people openly talking about it and creating that safe space. So um, I think it's what mainly comes to my mind when you're asking uh, this question about um, a few challenges that people face from the community. Yeah. Hi, Alexis here. Yeah, I think, you know, um, you guys have covered so many major points I deeply resonate with. And uh, I'd just like to, you know, I think talk about some of like my thoughts when it popped out when I think about this question. Uh, I think just that it's really important to talk about that this context we're talking about is in the workplace, right? And we know that I think it, it, with my own personal experience of like building a career in the workplace, I know that seeking for mentorship uh, networks, you know, all of these resources are really, really critical to career success, you know, in, in the workplace. And I think just the overall context of like less women, you know, are in leadership power whether if they're straight or LBTQ, you know, that itself already results in, in, in the comparatively less resources and support. And I think direct channel to, you know, you know to the top of the organization um, when we are in need to like, let our voices be heard and really kind of vocalize our unique needs. And I think you talk about, um, I heard about awareness as well, and which is true. Like as a queer woman, I could be wearing a unicorn onesie and like putting rainbows on my face every day, and people would still not assume for me to be queer. It's it's true. Like I've done it many times, and people still come up to me assuming I'm very straight. Mm -hmm. So it's it's true. So I think the lack of awareness is there. And talking about invisibility, I think that's the word that rings with it too. But I actually want to bring a perspective, you know, when I was thinking about this question is that I think LBTQ women also have unique challenges with each group, you know, but I think it's set apart not exactly by alphabets. It could be actually set apart by visibility. So if you have the LBTQ woman who choose to express themselves with, with more of a gender neutral and masculine look, they could be more easily targeted identify right but they could also be, could be kind of assumed with more uh, different gender roles but if you're fem feminine looking uh, I think invisibility is an issue and then for me myself like taking the mental load of needing to come out of every single social interaction or be, to be uh, assumed wrongly it's really tiring because I have to make that decision a lot so I don't know if there's something that resonates with the other LB Tiki woman here but and also for transgender women you know I think they just have so many different more layers to the vulnerability in addition to like um, what you two said as well, just on top of being a woman, which is already quite a marginalized status in, in the corporate world. And I think all of that, you know, kind of define the unique challenges, like in my experience. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'd love to share a little bit about my experience as well. I think in this part of the world, um, whereby the Asian context, the culture, it's more conservative. And then you're in a company that's quite liberal and accepting, uh, accepting inclusive. Um, sometimes I agree with Alexis, I take a moment to think. When someone asks me, oh, what do you do over the weekend? Do you go on a date with your boyfriend? I'm like, okay, this person, how do I, you know, I find myself putting people in boxes as well. Like, okay, uh, she is an auntie in Singapore. Uh, I think she may not be so open, you know, all this chain of thoughts. So I'm not sure as well because she's also an oracle for 20 years, for example. And yeah, I guess this is really what people face on the ground, like that decision, the, how do you reconcile the culture of the country you live in and the culture in that organization. So, yeah. Can I, can I share a, a very quick, small example, a real-time experience? Please, please. So I was, I was uh, talking to the senior leader, a woman, and she's from UK. She was from UK, right? And I was trying to tell her how I was looking at job opportunities uh, to move to Bombay, another city in uh, India, to spend some time with my partner. And I used the word partner. And I thought I'm, I'm going to come out to her. And I'm really preparing mentally all about, you know, being ready for all of this. And then she says, oh, what does he do? Right? And I'm like, oh, no. And I just changed the gender. My instant reaction was to change the gender. He, I kept the profession. And he was a mixologist. I said, he was a mixologist removing the gender. So I think because of a certain way that you look, people, there are assumptions going back to Shane's point, which is challenging. Definitely. Yeah, no, thank you all so much for these answers. It's a really great way to kind of, to get us started. A lot of kind of some of the themes that I was really pulling out were just the assumptions that are made in the workplace as well as kind of the lack of role models. So uh, thank you all for your, for your answers. Um, so another thing um, here, I guess I'll, I'll start and I'll start with Shane, who I know is an ERG leader, but also I know a few of you are as well. So um, she, I'll direct this at Shane, but obviously everyone feel free to hop in after she answers. Um, so Shane, as an ERG leader, what tips would you have for ERGs to play a key role in creating these safe and welcoming workplaces for LBTQ women? And if there are any kind of specific considerations that can be made, particularly through the ERG um, mechanism and context. Oh, I think you're muted. Hi, hi everyone. Um, yes, uh, I, I see a role. Uh, I am an ERG leader for my country. Uh, I, I, I lead the uh, a, a PJ, you know, co-lead for Dell Technologies. And an ERG leader is, plays a very important role because um, for me, you know, at workplace, because I remember when I joined Dell Technologies, you know, when I joined, I was in the cocoon stage, you know, I was not transited completely. And I had this fear of transiting at workplace because I had this job insecurity. I was like, would my workplace welcome me with my new change, you know, or would I be booted out? And luckily, when I came to know that there is something called pride and there is support that we can get and there's something called diversity, there's this, there's this culture all in itself, that motivated me to come out more open. That motivated me to transit. That, that gave me kind of assurance. So today, you know, I'm an ERG leader. I could be happy because my company has allowed me to transit. I can just sit back and relax. But no, I want to be the voice for the closets, you know, because there are many, you know, especially the APAC region who are not open at workplace because of so many cultural, society, parents, and being workplace also, you know, they are afraid to come out. So basically we want to be the voice, we want to be the assurance for them. You know, for example, when we launched Pride, you know, that was an eye opener for a country like India. And especially we launched it when we did not have 377. And post Pride, we did so many events, you know, uh, we, um, we, we teamed up with, with we have this uh, diversity, uh, you know, uh, organization called Pride Circle. Uh, that, that comes up with amazing programs. We have Mobera Foundation, which comes up with amazing programs. So we do various kinds of awareness programs where we literally educate people about the community because what, what exactly people lack is awareness. 
they do, they do not know because this is not there in our education system. We do not teach this to our children. So we kind of start with awareness, you know, let people know what the community is all about, what a lesbian is, what a transgender is. We are all bucketized as gays. We are all bucketized as transgenders. We are all, but see, they are these, as you know, Ashwata said, you know, you know, have you just, if you look like a tomboy, you're not a boy, you know, these are the assumptions people make. And that's why it's important to have these kind of conversations at workplace and, you know, these kind of discussions which, which break that, which breaks that chain and, and, and gives that education. And that's what our role as an ERG leader is to understand what challenges people face when we have meetings, to understand what programs that we can launch, you know, to spread more kind of awareness, like a panel discussion. The most recent one, which one of uh, the India APJ lead, uh, you know, the India lead came up with an amazing program teamed up with Pride Circle called Ally Challenge, which was for 21 days. So 21 days continuously we were programming about the community and that gave so much of goodness. We had a, we had a panel discussion with all the ERG leads. So all the ERG leads had a panel discussion which was open to all. So every ERG lead shared their personal experience. So storytelling is a personal way of connecting. People might want to hear your story and they might want to know why it's important for them to support. So these are the things. And we also made some changes like policy changes, like same sex partner benefits. So that gives you assurance. So basically if somebody is in a closet and he has a partner, he'll feel like, wow, I'm in a great company. Even if I come out in future, they're going to support my partner, you know, or somebody like me who's transiting at workplace who may not be comfortable visiting a male washroom. We have a gender neutral washroom. So these are the many changes that we have bought at workplaces. And yes, most important is awareness programs like these make a huge change. And uh, also we teamed up with Out and Equal and we go there, we learn so much. I, you know, I've been twice to the Out and Equal Summit and I've learned so much and I've imbibed so much that I come back and I do that good work in my country here. So it's, it's very important. Then, um, in a good point, and, and, and I'm just gonna add on to um, what you said. Um, I think another point also being, when you think about uh, starting an employer resource group or an ERG, I think rightly, as you said, right, the, the main intent has to be awareness and education. Um, I feel a lot of the people, and I know a handful of people who's, who had reached out to me in the past, um, try and put the intent as here, how do we get people to come out? I think that's a, you know, I would, I would kind of just call, want to call it out saying, don't focus on that. Don't focus on wanting people to come out yet. I think focus on creating a space where people feel safe to come out in the first place, you know? And if people come out, that's great. Um, so I just, I just wanted to add on to uh, what Shane said on that one. Hi, I was just adding some thoughts. I think um, if I could give any tips to for the Pride ERGs, you know, across the world to create a safe and welcoming environment for LBTQ women. I think the really the fundamental thing that you can do is just to make sure you have equal represent, representation of like, you know, um, LBGBTQ, each letter in the group. Because we know that the diversity of the leadership itself, it sets the DNA for the, uh, for the programming of the, um, for what you're going to do. What's, what's going to be the social activities? How, how's the networking going to be like? Are you going to take care of like people's different uh, desire social activities, right? We have heard a lot of jokes in the queer woman community, like, where do the introverted, you know, queer woman go? Like, we don't always party. So I think in the ERG, right, you can have like introverted activities and extrovert activities, and you can have some of this in-house or going out. So I think just the diversity of people who are driving the programs and the diverse, so then um, the, you have diverse perspectives and, and voices, you know, that's in the board is very, very critical, I think, to any ERG who want to make it safe, you know, for, for women. And I also think, um, in my experience, you have to make the Marcom very, very inclusive. So marketing communication, because we have mentioned before, right, we, we talked about the, the general public's awareness. I think, in fact, I think maybe I can only represent Asia, but I think because the media portrayal in the movies and films in the past, I think LBTQ women was never like the, the main focus of the stories in entertainment. So when a lot of people, I think, firstly associate LGBTQ here, they think of a Caucasian gay man. 
right? So then we're sort of now, the, you know, something that pops in their mind first, you know? So I think subsequently like our need as well. So I think it's really important to communicate visually. Let's say you wanna like uh, put up events and stuff. You wanna make sure like queer women is in the picture, uh, visually in the images that you use in the emails and, and the people who invite to these panels as well. I think that's very important. Yeah, so those are our two tips from me. Mm. Great, awesome. And uh, Geraldine, I just want to make sure that, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Um, yeah, probably a little bit of personal sharing as well when it comes to specifically starting up an ERG, which I'd experienced about two years ago now. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, and you all probably know anyway, in this part of the world, it is a rather hush-hush, you know, don't talk about it, you know, kind of topic, um, being the LGBT community. And uh, before we launched the chapter, I did kind of wanted to get a sense check on the ground. So I just asked employees, you know, um, what do you think about this? Do you think this is important? Um, and I was very surprised to, to experience a lot of actually outright uh, discriminatory remarks um, about the community from people I never expected from because I worked with them quite closely. Uh, obviously, they, they don't know I'm part of the community. They didn't. And uh, my advice, you know, uh, when it comes to starting our ERG is, you know, use this as extra motivation to get yourself started. Um, of course, there will be some tearful nights, um, but you've got to have a good support system as well. I got a couple of uh, straight allies who started the community with me in Singapore. So they were like, you know, um, if you don't want to go through it anymore, leave those uh, question, uh, asking and questions to us and then we can e evaluate together later. So having a strong support system, using it as an extra motivation and boost for you to make a difference for the quiet minorities, I think that would be yeah, a little something I would share. Definitely. Uh, thank you so much. Um, moving on to the, to the next question. and um definitely focused on i think shweta and um, geraldine who are some of our panelists who work in uh, uh hr so what are some of the policies that companies can implement that can and that can improve the experiences of their lbtq employees and then furthermore why are these uh policies so important um okay, um i'm gonna take that up first so um, I think one is um, policies are important, and I think I have a certain bias coming from HR in this one, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Besai. But policies are important, uh, I would say it gives people the language, a common language to talk. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm going to come back to that point. Um, I think, first and foremost, have an inclusion policy. Right. Uh, a lot of the companies, and I know when I started, I mean, having worked with various companies out here in India, we had uh, our inclusion policy mainly came from a conversation that kind of uh, started uh, globally. But that's great. And we ended up having our own, I mean, an inclusion po policy for India, too. Um, even if you don't have, if you're not a global company, please have an inclusion policy and calling out every single thing as a part of that policy, including sexual orientation and calling out LBG. I mean, every single letter of it, right? Again, we need to really, um, and it's especially part of a company, talk, talk, um, use those words a lot more than we use otherwise. Um, so policies are important, which is inclusion policy. Um, and then I would think in my mind, number two would be also have a non-discrimination policy because if you have an inclusion, inclusive, I mean, inclusion policy, and then people are coming out and they, if they're not, if they are facing harassment, if they're not feeling safe, and the, your non-discrimination policy, number one, the policy needs to be there. And again, needs to very explicitly uh, cover inclusion from an LBQ to uh, Q, uh, QT um, community um, coverage point of view so that, you know, um, they can be protected in, in, in the environment or not. Um, and another, another one being, uh, you know, uh, and these two policies, right? And not just these two policies, every single policy document that you have in the company, uh, I'd say, make it gender neutral in terms of the language um get you know remove the he's and the hers and the she's and put them theirs you know make it inclusive um you would think and these are simple things to do right 
These are simple things to do, which has, personally from my experience, has helped um, really a lot in moving the needle on the journey of inclusion at a much faster pace um, than anything else. So um, if I have to really call out on top on priority, I think these, these would be three, three things that uh, um, I'd call out. And, and then going beyond, of course, um, you know, extending your uh, benefits and making those benefits accessible to everyone in the community then, right? Uh, in India today, and I, we just, um, and I'm extremely happy in the team and I'm very thrilled about it, right? So we just uh, uh, renewed our insurance, medical insurance policy, uh, extending the coverage for same-sex partners. So it's possible in India too, right? It's just that uh, you just need to look for it and you will find it. And I think, um, yeah, so those are a few of the things uh, that I, I could share. Yeah, for me and our Oracle, we are looking beyond policies. Like obviously, policies are instrumental in um, changing behaviors. Um, but we are focusing our energy more on cultural shift. So um, there are three parts we are looking at. Firstly, you know, how do we look at corporate policies and benefits program? Um, just to echo what Shweta has said, you know, absolutely. How do we make every, everything inclusive? How do we language the policy? Um, do we ask, say, a same-sex couple the same questions that we would ask a straight couple? Um, if, it, if, we are, if that's not a question we will ask the straight couple, is that even an appropriate question to ask? Things like that um, when you want to apply for, you know, um, uh, dependence, uh, benefits program, things like that. So that's one part, the corporate side of things. Um, the second one would be obviously the leaders have to, to really set the example. Um, you know, there are lots of conversations around should there be measurables around the quota, the number of um, people in the gay community, in, the, in their team, you know, it's rather controversial. I think a lot of companies are, are, are you know, trying that out and much with great success. Some are doing it, but not, not with much success because they're just meeting the numbers for the heck of it, uh, but not really trying to find meaning out of it. So um, if, if there are ways we can influence our leaders, you know, it could be not just by policies or not just with the stick, but also with a carrot as well, right? Like how can we incentivize them? How can we give them employer of choice, leader of choice within uh, the company? Um, that could be something that's enticing as well. And naturally, we really want them to incorporate um, equal opportunities, you know, um, objective evaluation when it comes to talent management, not only who they hire, but really actively train them on how to assess a talent while eliminating their unconscious bias. So that's the second part of um, hoping to change the culture. And then the third part is obviously we're doing it for the people. We want to hear from the people. Um, and we talked about this already, ERGs are obviously very important and they are a strong force. Look at um, countries now, you know, even countries are changing laws and policies because people are really vocal about it, fighting for their rights and all that. So how do we channel that kind of conversation in a very productive manner? So using this, these three um, facets, uh, we're hoping to change the culture, or not say change, you know, make it even more inclusive. And yeah, I think that happens beyond policies and benefits. I think on behalf of, um, you know, just showing my support to the transgender community as well, I, I want to talk about facility uh, in terms of policy. I think there's something actually that's uh, um, something we should be talking about. How do we not only change the software of what's in the handbook, right? Uh, the practices that we do, you know, uh, but also like make our environment just more friendly to, to LBTQ. So like, you know, using colors or the design of it, you know, make it friendly to people with, who define, uh, identify differently. And for example, I'm, I'm making two examples. For example, um, uh, gender neutral bathrooms and mom room, right? Are we gonna make it inclusive to people who uh, who might stand differently, right? Position themselves differently in the spectrum. Are we welcoming moms, right? But who who might not just identify as straight? So I think actually facility team needs to be a part of this conversation too. And if, if you think about bathroom, it's something that people use every single day. And in fact, like if the communication comes from something that everybody uses and they feel welcome, like at just everyday 
facilities, actually, it could really create a change. And everyone, I think it's a great place to signal that this is a safe space for you. And the company already embedded the NI down to like all these details, you know, that makes up our workplace. So I actually think facilities should be part of this policy talk too. Yeah. Definitely. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, all right, moving on to um, the next question. And um, anyone can feel free to jump in. But Alexis, I know that you particularly work in learning and development. So this is kind of directed at you, but anyone else can feel free to hop in. Um, what are some of the different, some possible different learning and development initiatives that can help to create a better environment for LBTQ women? And um, yeah. Thank you. It's my honor to be cute. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, cute, <laughs> pun intended. Um, I think, uh, um, yeah, I think in learning development, I think we first just need to start with a really, really basic code of conduct. I actually think like code of con conduct really, really well done, really shows a company's position and then um, how seriously they take this whole thing. Because in code of conduct, you talk about the legal side of things as well. You talk, you talk about leadership accountability and potential, I think, consequences of malpractice as well. And I think code of conduct is usually given to all the employees who first came to the company. So I think that it's sort of like deliver in the very, very critical timing when they come, you're showing that you need to do things this way. This is our standard you need to comply. So I think code of conduct needs to be really, really done well. And then all the DNI perspectives and standards need to be set there out and loud. So that's one. And uh, in Nielsen, we have updated code of, uh, updated version of code of conduct every year. And we, we actually follow that really rigorously. I think for most global companies, I think you would be doing the same. Um, could you provide an example of code of conduct? Um, I think uh, anti-discrimination, uh, that's, that's one, uh, for example, and, and respective language, uh, that's one too. And um, um, I think, um, I think pretty much like all the common sense things, you know, regarding equality and anti-discrimination, uh, that, that sort of thing is in code of conduct. But of course, every company has specific ones, you know, in a code of, con code of conduct, some other companies, they may uh, have more concerns regarding, for example, like uh, briberies and stuff, but those are not relevant to the, our topic today. But I think the most relevant ones is about respectful languages and anti-discrimination. Um, yeah, and um, the other top, the other training that I think will be really relevant to all would be actually talking about unconscious bias training. So this is something that we've launched and I realized that really you're, you're teaching about um, the whole DNI from a very scientific point of view. You talk, teach about cognitive science and why we became a uh, human with such biases. You even talk about like evolutionary and tribal time and the way that we're so inclined to be biased. Like we, we are influenced by 175 different unconscious biases every day. And we kind of just kind of like throw the numbers out there. People start to be aware of their implicit biases. And then you have women who come to me and said that, oh my gosh, I took that test you recommended and realized I am, I have internalized sexism. You know, so you have like, you're not only waking up men, but you're waking up women as well. And really in that way, you're making people much more sensitized to the issues and realizing, oh my gosh, I didn't even know I have that. What can I do about it, right? So really kind of increasing interest in that. I think unconscious bias is very important and uh, has been very impactful, my experience. And um, the other topics I will talk about is general like woman uh, empowerment uh, workshops. So I think like, it's, I think Google did a really good job, I have to say. Like, they have a workshop named I'm Remarkable. I'm not, I'm not doing promo for them, but I really admire what they have done. Uh, it's actually a workshop that focuses on raising self-esteem and for women to come to really value how unique they are and how valuable they are to themselves. And I think that kind of workshop could really help uh, anyone actually with a minority status. They, as far as I know, they have extended that to LGBTQ people as well. At, uh, at, at their workplace and have really uh, made a huge impact. So I think something that comes with emotional empowerment could be really helpful too. And um, I think, uh, of course, embedding LGBTQ and, and LBTQ women's perspective in all of the uh, diversity training should be, you know, that should be definitely a must. I think in the examples that we use, right, we don't, uh, we want to, um, you know, raise empath empathies with stories from LBTQ women and like and, and talk about that you know every single letter on the spectrum their story could be different they could have different needs different struggles right? and and give the attention and honor to the, each letter not just generalize them all as a group 
and, and have a very give people a very vague concept and just ask people to uh, to respect. Um, I think every letter has to have you know could come from a different path. So yeah, I think above all, I just like um, a few from my experience, but I'm super open to hear uh, what's done in other companies and um, um, welcome more questions um, uh, from the audience as well. Yeah, um, adding to what Alexis said, you know, code of conduct, uh, for me, a classic example for a code of conduct would be if you have a pride chapter, you know, in your country, you know, it would kind of, you kind of spread awareness on the importance of the language to be used, for example, because in a country like mine, you know, um, gay is more used as a joke, you know, you might want to do a small play and you, you see two boys playing and you just say they're gays and we laugh. So what? There's nothing funny about two men talking and, and why, do I, why do you have to laugh about it, you know? So code of conduct covers these kinds of sensitive things, kind of language that we use probably would, would hurt someone, you know, personally, you know? You know, for example, see, my appearance is like a lady, but I do have a harsh voice. So for somebody to make fun of my voice, you know, saying that, no, you're not a lady, you're a man. It, it is hurting me, right? So these kinds of sensitive things, the other person may not think, you know, he might be thinking that it is just a voice that you're talking about, but he might be hurting me because he's demeaning me, saying that, no, you're not the gender. You look at your voice. Though you're draped up in a sari, you're still a man. You know, those kinds of sensitive things are covered in code of conduct, you know? So these kind of things play a very vital role. So basically, when you have these set rules and guidelines, so an employee who joins knows that every employee needs to be treated with respect, you know? And code of conduct also covers for single parent, you know? I could be a transgender with a child, or you could be a, 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 a girl, you know, a, a lady with, with, a, with a single parent, and they laugh about, you're not married, but you have a child. You know, that is not a totally no sense. You have every right to be a single parent. It is your choice, you know? Do not have to have a partner to have a pet to be a parent you know so those kind of things are covered in code of conduct you know so whoever wanted to know what code of conduct exactly does so basically your company would streamline in detail when they do code of conduct they might want to cover these so ensure that the code of conduct you know which, which talks about workplace harassment which talks about these and that it should also include that you know how to address the community and these things, you know, desensitization, this, this is something that you should include in your code of conduct. If you don't have it, you should include it immediately. It plays a very important, you know. Um, uh, Parina, if you have a minute, I'm just gonna add on to, again, what uh, Shane and Alexis said, and I think on Alexis' point on uh, unconscious bias. Um, so there is uh, one of the training that we did um, in, in one of the companies that I worked with, and it was extremely powerful was, uh, it was a training called Inclusion is Personal. I mean, so it was more of a conversation than a training, right? And we, and that was, for me, I think, um, uh, was extremely impactful when we did that training. It was, as I said, so any any inclusion that you're trying to drive overall or LB, um, LBTQ specific, right? I think it's very important. I think our, our, instant, um, our instant reaction is to look outward you know, ERGs, XYZ, you know, let's think about what can we do and actions we can do to make this happen. I think the trick is to make it intrinsic, look inward, have the conversation is again, touching upon bias. We have such deep rooted biases are not wrong. We just need to be aware and then, you know, correct it sometimes if it's going on the negative side, right? So I think um, um, inclusion is uh, personal, right? So th I think what we did in that training was to ask the question to each and every person, what inclusion means to you? Right. And then you, you pick up a topic like sexual orientation and then you engage with your audience and see, hey, how do you feel about this? Or when I'm talking to someone and I'm a, I'm a trainer and I'm telling um, him or her, whoever, you know, and telling them, uh, if I'm telling you that, hey, I, um, I'm a woman who's a lesbian in terms of my sexual orientation, how does it make you feel? You know, and then you start the conversation from there and not put company DI policies, company XYZ things onto them first. You start the conversation from them, and then you move on to, you know, um, what your company policy is about, see the gap, and then you have something to work with. Or they might say, or you might even um, end up with a conversation which says, you know what, uh, that's where they stand. They're not, they're not, they've not bought into it. You know, and then you have a conversation thereon, you know? 
So I think uh, that was very powerful. I thought I'll just put it out there. Um, basically making it a conversation and very individual specific to start with. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to add on as well when it comes to learning and development initiatives. So in Oracle, uh, big shout out to Cheryl Lander, who's also on the call here. Uh, she is our open co-chair and uh, she was part of a team that created um, an LGBTQ 101 learning path in Oracle. So I'm, I'm sure it's quite common in a lot of our companies as well. There's a learning path whereby step one, you know, you learn this and you progress to step two, you learn a deeper um, level of a certain subject, so far and so forth. So really, what is L, what is G, you know, things like that. And you know, now we're in the virtual world, uh, we're all quarantined in one way or another. Um, it's a great way for people to have access to it at their own time and also in private. So we did that just before the Pride Month and it was uh, very well received. So that's a, an L&D initiative I'd like to share with everyone. All right, great. So we have gotten very many questions. So there, um, and thank you all so much for sending out your questions and we definitely will not be able to answer them all. So just wanted to, to put that out there, but uh, obviously thank you so much for sending them. And we'll definitely have more discussions like this moving forward. And always, if your question doesn't get answered or if you have any additional questions after the call, feel free to email us at hello at outandequal.org and we'll get back to you. Um, but to kind of get this question and answer um, session started, um, here's uh, a question. So in your respective roles and in your respective countries, how do you help your companies and ERGs balance a global DNI perspective, yet making sure that the impact is localized based on your region and culture? And there's a lot of different questions on how to kind of balance local culture and local regions based on different kind of global DNI perspectives, if you will. So anyone can feel free to, to hop in. Okay, I'm happy to start. Um, so when we started our ERG in Singapore, and similarly, I assisted in a couple of others in the region in their starting phase, uh, we did have to work quite closely with HR. Um, and of course, our internal legal team as well, just to understand the, the local dynamics uh, and the suitability. Um, unfortunately, there are some countries we were not able to implement um, or be loud about uh, our community. Uh, and that's at least a little, a little bit out of our control, but uh, inside the Oracle environment, you know, we still share you know, broadcast emails from the headquarters on some awesome stuff that we're doing in the community for these groups of people. Uh, I, I thought I'll, I'll share an example that happened in um, Japan actually. Uh, there was an employee who actually voiced up their discomfort towards uh, receiving emails like that. And I guess this is something we can ex expect as well, you know, as much as we want people to kind of respect us, we've got to respect people's stance as well. Um, but what really, um, really impressed me was how members from the headquarters, from the DNI team came, wrote a very um, firm and kind email as well to say that you know this is what we really value as an organization and inclusive culture and uh, unfortunately I cannot we cannot exclude you from the distribution list of 140,000 people um, so if this doesn't make you comfortable or you may simply delete it so that was really a very clear stance as to you know what this is the company's position and you know we're here to stay kind of thing that's yeah, to answer this question, you know, I would say, you know, yes, every country has a different law and, you know, that, that, that governs. And, uh, and as, as global DNI leaders, you know, you definitely want your company, wherever country it is based, you, you definitely want to have a normal, you know, norm everywhere. But unfortunately, you will not be able to do so. But, for example, there might be some countries where you will not be able to have a pride chapter, but you can still have a remote pride chapter, you know. Basically, you might want to work remotely, like, like how we work virtually, you know, it's a remote chapter where you work remotely. So that works out because initially when India, when, when we were wanted to do our pride, you know, we were not allowed to do because we had section 377 that time. So uh, it took lots of time, but still we were connected. You know, we, you know, pride members were connected remotely, you know, 
we were connected remotely. Later, yes, we did launch Pride. Uh, we had uh, Eric Day, um, a senior VP leader, who, who actually came down, spoke to local HRs, you know, and and you know, and 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 let us know that it was important. And and Pride has nothing to do, you know, with the country laws and those things. And and that's how we launched Pride, even though we had Section 3 Samson. After that, Section 3 Samson went away. We were able to do more active programs. But again, I would say, yes, you have to customize as per your regions because every country, you know, would have a different culture base that you might want to target, you know. Uh, you know, certain things that are practiced in the United States, probably I would not be able to practice that in India all of a sudden. But still, we can try to get somewhere there nearby, but, but it is still possible, you know. And I think we should never give up. And as ERG leaders, you know, we should always go for it. You know, that's the beauty about it. You know, you will have people for, for against you, but it doesn't matter. As long as it is doing good for your employee, go for it. I think, um, hi, Alexis here again. Um, I think, um, yeah, this, th I think balancing the global program, I mean, global perspective and local perspective was definitely a challenge to me personally when I started all of DNI programs here in China. I think really different cultural landscape, you know, they talk about the same concept really from diff with different analogies and different concepts. So really, really working on like the cross cultural translation itself was already a lot of work. And I've translated pretty much all of the materials myself. And um, there was a lot of work in adding locally relevant analogies. For example, I explained a concept of DNI as a hot pot. You know, like in a hot pot in China, and then you have all these different things sitting on the table and you put it in the pot and you cook is the inclusion. It's something that makes Chinese people like resonate. So it's really important, I think, to, for me to find these like, locally cultural relevant like examples and to tell them, oh, this is DNI. And I always stress to them that we're not doing this because our headquarters is in America and we have to please someone there. We're doing this to benefit our communities here. So I constantly talk about that this is benefiting you. This is benefiting all of us here. So I really talk about the benefits to the local communities here and then this would really benefit people in their circles too. So I, yeah, I think there was a lot of work in, in terms of that. And I, you know, the, the word customized, it really is the case. And I think when we communicate back to the headquarters, you know, having the, the courage to stand out, to say that actually it looks a little bit differently here, right? When you send me the training programs, can, can, I, can you invest some in me so I can update some of these examples and images so then it could be locally relevant. Just daring to voice up what you need as well so then you have a convincing story and you have what you need to tell, to tell your story. I think that's very important. And um, I also think one tip that really helped uh, was actually to find local partnerships with the different LGBT focus groups, let's say, because they, they actually have a lot more resources and, and, and I think insights into what the local community is and the, the, the resources maybe were already there. So but partnering up with uh, local partners as well, I think you could actually leverage a lot of their resources and experience and build something that's more locally relevant for you. Uh, in my case of working with Shanghai Pride, I think they've really helped me a lot. Uh, into giving me some uh, local resources that's in Shanghai. And of course, for Guangzhou and Beijing, that's also looking different. So yeah, that's just my experience. I hope that answers um, your questions. And I see Daniel, a tip, tell them you want to know about their best practices from the other ERGs. <laughs> I'm, just saying, I'm just saying, fight, yes. And then also, you know, and say, hey, they are an established ERG, whether it's women's ERG or, you know, whichever topic, and then tell them, let's also learn best practices from you and, and draw, draw a line and a mutual benefit out of it, you know? It usually works too. Great, all right. Um, so moving along to the next question, and this is kind of a broad question, kind of going back to the very beginning of our discussion. So when we were talking about all the stereotypes and the assumptions that uh, we encounter on a daily basis. How do we do the work to break the stere stereotypes and what can we do to educate others? And I realize that this is not easy and kind of what mm -hmm. we're all doing on a, on a daily basis, but I think any, any kind of, any guidance, any experiences I think would be very valuable. Mm -hmm. If you're a part, yeah. uh, sorry, Shane, you wanna go? No, no, you can go ahead. Um, if you're a part of the community, just go out there, be out there, be out there, 
you know you need to be seen right number one to break stereotypes i've 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 been doing this i don't i don't enjoy talking about my sexual orientation and my personal life to the world <laughs> you know i'm not straight people don't do it why am i doing it <laughs> so i'm just saying i'm out here because listen i need to be seen more i need to be seen breaking stereotypes um so that is number one if you're a part of the community be out there at least have that in your mind it's going to happen right it's only going to help others um if you're a part of the ally group i was talking to a friend earlier yeah, but if you're if you're part of an ally group hey again be out there very boldly don't just support subtly right uh saying i'm doing this for myself my friends family no be out there talk about it right create awareness talking about it again um and and i think i think these are these are two things uh, that really come to my mind because otherwise it's a, it's a constant journey as you said karina it's a constant journey but i think these are two two things that come to my mind that is um, really worked and I, which i personally kind of believe um in yeah, yeah. I, i would like to share something i'm quite proud of uh um of oracle again <laughs> uh, recently uh, on our internal directory we call we call it aria uh there's a new field that uh, that asks for your preferred pronouns as well as our slack um uh you know internal communication too as well there's also a few for preferred pronouns i think again being in this part of the world whereby it's really uncomfortable talking about this this topic uh what we are looking for as well especially from allies too you know that that little quiet support like you can do it you know we're here behind you um you know with little things like that you know having putting up an, an a badge in our internal directory that says that you're an ally uh putting filling up your preferred pronouns field i think this uh, i had so many so many questions coming to me i see she her on your name what does that mean and there's gotten so many educational topics going conversations going so that's one way uh that i can contribute Awesome. Um, does anyone else have any anything that they'd like to add? Um, all right. Um, well, if no one else has any, uh, just one more one more shout out in case any of the other panelists have anything they'd like to contribute um, to this question. All right. Um well, I think that that is unfortunately all the time that we have today. Um we are about at the at the end of the hour. So, um first I wanted to thank all of the panelists for joining us today. I think it was a really really great conversation and it's very clear that there are so many questions left unanswered, but I think that's good, right? It's good to that we were able to generate this really great conversation and I thank all of you um for joining us and for sharing all of your invaluable experiences and all of the great work that you all have been doing at your uh, respective companies as well as outside um and yeah so thank you all so much for um for joining the panel and then thank you all for um all the all the viewers um thank you for joining us and being so um active in the chat um it's always really great to it's always good to have too many questions <laughs> um, so as a reminder this um was recorded and will be sent to all who registered um so keep an eye out on your email for that and um there's also a survey for you to take as well and we'd really love to hear um any additional feedback um and yeah that's that's all that we have for today but again thank you to the panelists and to all for joining um and i hope you all have a great rest of your day wherever you are in the world and um goodbye thank you thank you thank you bye thank you bye thank you all